In this video, we will learn how to calculate standard deviation. I'm Abby with NextGen Personal Finance, and we will practice looking at how useful standard deviation is when comparing investments like stocks versus bonds. It's useful to understand in standard deviation because it provides us with a measurement of the dispersion or spread of a data set in relation to its mean. Low standard deviation means that the data is clustered around the mean, and high standard deviation indicates that the data is more spread out. There are calculators and functions that easily provide you with the standard deviation of a data set, but for now, we will practice calculating by hand so we can take a look at how the process works. Today we'll be calculating the standard deviation of historical stocks and the standard deviation of historical bonds. There are different reasons why one may choose to invest in stocks and or bonds, as indicated on this infographic, and they each have their different levels of risk and volatility, which we will examine mathematically through standard deviation. Let's try this example. We are provided with annual returns of stocks in the S&P 500 for these 10 years, 1928 to 1937, and are asked to find the standard deviation of the data. I am going to show you the five main steps when calculating the standard deviation and will provide you time to put it into practice after each step. The first thing we can do is calculate the mean of the data. We can find the mean average by adding up all of the data points, then dividing by the number of data points we have. We can find the average return of the stock market for these 10 years by adding them up to equal 50.04 and then dividing by 10 for 10 data points, which will give us 5.004. Go ahead and calculate the mean of your data set here. Your practice problem has a data set of the annual returns of bonds for the same 10 years, 1928 to 1937. Pause the video here and calculate the mean of this data. Next, we have to find the distance between each data point and the mean from step one. So for this first line, I will subtract 43.81 minus our mean from step one of 5.004, which gives me 38.806. For the next year, I can subtract negative 8.30 minus 5.004, which gives me negative 13.304. I will now complete the step for the rest of the data points. Now it's your turn. Find the differences between each of your data points and the mean that you calculated from step one. Okay, so far we have found the mean and the distances from each data point to the mean. For step three, we must now square each difference that we found in step two. For the first year, 38.806 squared is equal to 1505.906. For the second year, negative 13.304 squared is equal to 176.996. I will now complete the step for the rest of the data points. Now you try. Square each of your values from step two and write those in a new column. We are almost there. We must now find the mean average of all of the values that we got from step three. Just like earlier, we can find the mean by adding up all the values and dividing by the number of values. The sum of all the values from step three is 11,318.539. Then, divided by 10 is 1,131.8539. Let's look at your practice problem. What is the mean average of your values from step 3? This is the last and final step to find standard deviation. The value that we currently have is actually called the variance of the data, but that's for another video lesson. In order to find the standard deviation, we can take the square root of this variance, the value from step four. The square root of 1,131.8539 is equal to 33.6430364. So our final answer for the standard deviation of the returns of stocks for these 10 years is about 33.64%. 
Try calculating your last step for your practice problem. What is your final standard deviation solution? Great job on learning how to calculate standard deviation. All of the five steps that we just completed is actually represented mathematically through this formula here. It may seem like a lot, but we just followed the five steps. First, we calculated the mean of the data. Then we found the differences between each data point and the mean. For step three, we squared each of those differences. Next, we found the mean of those squared differences, which gave us a value called the variance. And the last step we did was take the square root to give us our standard deviation. But what does the standard deviation look like visually? You might recognize a bell curve, also known as a normal distribution. The standard deviation actually determines the shape of the curve, meaning how flat, wide, narrow, or how tall the curve is. So what does my standard deviation of 33.64% look like? Let's do a quick sketch. I'm going to use rounded whole numbers just for this sketch. Our mean was about 5%, so we can put this value at the center of the curve. Then I can add my standard deviation of about 34% to the right three times to give us three standard deviations. One standard deviation to the right is five plus 34, which equals 39, then plus 34 again, which gives us 73, then plus 34 again, which gives us 107. And on the other side, on the left, I could subtract 34 to the left three times, giving us negative 29, negative 63, and negative 97. I can now visually analyze my data and see years from stock returns that fell within one standard deviation away from the mean, that fell two standard deviations away from the mean, and that fell three standard deviations away from the mean. What would your estimated bell curve sketch look like for your standard deviation? Compare my sketch for stock returns to your sketch for bond returns. Is yours more wide or more narrow? We can notice a lot of differences between the spread of the two data sets. What does this tell you about the returns over time for stocks versus bonds when thinking about risk and volatility? What do you think the data would look like for another set of 10 years? What about 50 or 100 years? Continue on to the practice problems on your worksheet to strengthen your understanding of how to calculate standard deviations and what this means when analyzing performances of stocks versus bonds. You got it!